Our Father, we come before you today, and our plea and prayer is that you will speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to do your will. We want to get involved in whatever it is you have for every one of us. And we pray that you will direct us, you will lead us, you will teach us, and you will speak directly to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, our lives belong to you. Our times are yours. Our hearts are yours. All we have we give unto you. Use everything within our possession to your glory and for your service in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that as we have laid our hands on the plow, we'll never look back. We'll never turn back. Amen. But we'll do your work successfully in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide us into the depths of your truth even tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, we want to see qualities of an effective minister. When God calls people, he appoints them to various services in the body of Christ. And there are ministers of the gospel, that is, there are people that God has called in a town or state to have a nationwide impact upon society. But in whatever area the Lord has called, and to whatever locality or scope of the work he has called anyone, there are qualities that make a man successful. If these factors of success are discovered and developed, in the life of such a minister, he'll be successful. But if the qualities or the factors are not discovered, he may find that he lives, he lives his life as a failure or a mediocre in the Lord's work. Many, many people have been called of God, but few ever qualify themselves to actually offer or render effective service unto the Lord. We have been concentrating on two such men that had a great impact, Barnabas and Paul. And we have seen some qualities in their lives already. Today we are just going to look at the last two. But before we look at the last two, I want to review with you some of the ground we have already covered. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 2. As the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now in John, Gospel according to St. John, chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it you. Then in verse 7 of that same chapter Jesus said if ye abide in me and my works abide in you ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Then in verse 8 herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. The desire of the Lord is that whoever he calls into any area of service, that individual will bear fruit in that area of service. And already I've read to you how Jesus himself said that none of the disciples called themselves or chose themselves that he is the one that chose them and that he chose them for a particular purpose and that purpose is that they will bear fruit if they are not bearing fruit they are not fulfilling the purpose if they are bearing fruit much fruit abundant fruit then they are fulfilling the purpose and each of us can begin to examine our own lives since we have become believers, because all believers are called to render service to the Lord 
It may just be that you are giving your testimony. The question is, does it bear fruit? It may be that you are telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ who can save. That means you are witnessing. You are calling upon the other people that you are a sinner before the Lord has now saved you. If they will give their lives to the Lord, the Lord will save them. The question is, are you bearing fruit? He might have given you a responsibility to go out and visit. And that's a ministry, a service for rendering for the glory of God. And so that there will be an impact in the lives of people. They will draw nearer unto the Lord. The question is, are we bearing fruit? Now he may give us a small assembly within the large assembly in the church. A small fellowship within the large fellowship of the flock of the Lord. It may be a church within a house. Within the church at large in the central church. That is, it may be that he has made you a young pastor, a young shepherd, among the members of the flock in a house fellowship, to feed, to nurture, to teach, to exhort, to lead. Now, in that capacity of leading and pastoring a small church, a house church, a small flock, within the large flock in the fold, are you bearing fruit? Are you fulfilling the purpose that he has called you to fulfill? Now, he may give you a larger ministry of overseeing some workers, maybe in a zone, in an area, or in a town. The question is, what impact are you having? Now be sure that if the Lord is giving you responsibility within the church circle, He wants you to bear fruit, and you have not chosen yourself. He has chosen you. Now the Lord chooses in various ways. He chose Moses at the backside of the desert. There was no fasting, there was no praying, there was no fellowship, there was no gathering of teachers and prophets all together, and the Holy Ghost speaking out in the church, saying, separate unto me, Moses, for the work I have called him to. He calls people in various ways. He called Joshua in a definite way. He called Elisha while Elisha was in the field, and a mantle came upon him. There was not an audible voice um, in a church circle, in a church fellowship, yet he was called. He called David in a definite way. Amos, he called one of the minor prophets. And of course, Jonah had the call of the Lord as to what he ought to do. And as to come into the New Testament, John the Baptist was called to be a foreigner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one by one, Jesus, when he began his ministry, he began to call the disciples one by one. And he put them in a particular responsibility. The way or the avenue, the channels by which the calls came were totally different. But every one of them received a call of the Lord. And in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4, Here we are told, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. And so many people have been called of the Lord. Of course, the responses have been different. As you read the Bible, you'll see that the initial response of Moses was different from the initial response of Joshua. And the initial response of Joshua was different from the initial response of Elisha. The initial response of Saul was different from the initial response of David. The initial response of Jeremiah was different from the initial response of Daniel. Now you see that uh, when people are called into service, depending on their background, depending on how they have been expecting the call, depending on the preparations they've been making, depending on the influence of their friends to, uh, upon them, depending upon the family tie, the family bondage, upon such people, depending on how they want to spend their lives, depending on how they are sensitive to the voice of God, the responses will vary. But the point is, God has called many, many people. And for some of them, he needed to even give them a push. You know, he was almost angry with uh, Moses. Before Moses will say, okay, in the final, uh, in the final stage, I will go. You know that even Jeremiah was uh, resisting it when he said, Ah, Lord, I'm a child. I cannot say what you want me to say. And the Lord said, Don't say that again. I'm calling you. 
And you know, the Lord had to talk to Ezekiel, saying, Even if the people have the face of an adamant stone, I'm still sending you to them. Therefore, you will speak forth, and you'll be bold and tell the people what I want you to tell them. And you know that when God brought that call through Jesus Christ to Peter, he fell down and said, Oh Lord, depart from me because I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy at all. Now, the responses of people will be different depending on where they, were, where they are spiritually, at what level, and how they are able to catch what the Lord is actually telling them. But then, whatever the initial response, all these people were read about in the Bible, eventually they received that call. They responded to that call. And they followed that call. But then, the question is, how did they eventually plow through, pray through? How did they eventually carry out the call that God had given them to carry out? Well, in particular now, we're looking at Paul and Barnabas. And as you look at the call of God upon your life, you'll discover that if you have all these qualities that these people exhibited, you'll be able to make a success of the call. If the call is successful, you'll be fruitful. If you are not fruitful, you should be re-examining yourself, saying, where am I missing it? Now, the minister, according to their gifts, they were called, and the minister just by the spiritual gifts the Lord had given them. In Romans chapter 12, verse 6, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Now, you'll discover in the body of Christ, there are members of the body of Christ that know that they have a call. But they have not really determined in what area they have a call. There are those who are called on the area of music, but they like to exhibit their talent or their lack of talent in preaching. There are people that are called to be pastors just to sit on a regular fellowship and just teach, but they like to go about and miss as evangelists. There are people that are called to a prayer ministry and a ministry of faith, abundant dynamic faith, but they like to go about and just be a teacher of the word of God, and that's not their calling. But you see, if you are going to really succeed in the work of the Lord, you need to recognize that you are called and you need to recognize what gifts the Lord has put in your life. In your life. So that you'll be able to just minister according to those gifts. Now there are natural gifts and there are spiritual gifts. And generally, but not always, generally, the Lord will merge the spiritual with the natural. Because even the natural gifts belong to the Lord. And you find that a man who has been or has had a natural tendency of teaching naturally you'll find that when he comes into the church that thing will just be added to and God will give him a spiritual gift that is called the gift of teaching and you find that a person that has you know the natural constitution or boldness to be able to confront anyone anytime anywhere for any reason, when he was still a sinner, he comes to the church, he's born again now, and that uh, spirit or that attitude that is able to confront anyone, anytime, anywhere, for any reason, you know, that man just becomes an evangelist and is given to the church as a gift, an evangelist, and he's able to confront sinners, he's able to confront um, anybody, no matter what that person may be, no matter what that person may be doing. And many times you'll find that it's always like that. And um, I can go through with you one by one again on those great men of God. Great men of God. Uh, and if we just think about Paul himself, naturally a man that was deep in the religion of the Jews. That man knew so much Greek, had so much impact, and could, you know, just get across his idea. Whatever idea was burning within him, that man had the ability within him naturally to be able to bring it forth. And as a sinner, he went all about persecuting the church. And he took a lot of energy from him. He went from house to house. He went from village to village. He went from place to place just to be able to confront the people that are Christians. He became a Christian. And you know the spiritual gift he had? He was a great evangelist and missionary and 
a prophet and a great apostle and he could confront princes, kings, governors, sinners, demon possessed people, could confront anybody anywhere but now with spiritual gift. But he had this natural thing even before he became a Christian. Now you'll find uh, the same thing with Moses even when he was still uh, over there in Egypt. When the people are not really understood his call, you know, he could confront almost anybody because he saw those people fighting. And naturally, even though he did not know how to really channel the natural thing he had within him, that boldness, that authority, that ability of confronting anyone, anytime, anywhere, for any reason, he just came against that man and he got rid of him. And then he, when he got there the second day, you know, there was no shyness or shame or timidity or inferiority complex or any inward looking uh, attitude. He just told that man and said, Why are you doing this against your neighbor? Why are you fighting? And that other man said, Well, who has made you a ruler of ours? You know, they discovered something that there was something natural within him that he wanted to rule, he wanted to govern, he wanted to lead. And you know that when the Lord eventually got through with him and called him, that's exactly what the Lord called him to do. And you'll find as you study throughout the Bible, you'll find that many times the Lord will give spiritual gifts that will be in line with the natural things that he created you with. Because, you know, if you think deeply about it, known unto God are all his works from the beginning. And before a man ever comes to the Lord, the Lord knows that man, knows that woman. And when you eventually come, he knows what gifts or talents to give. And when you become a Christian and are a member of the church, you better watch out and find out what those gifts are, what those talents are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing. And I want you to look at this, there are people that have a ministry of helps. Helps. You know that's a ministry? Oh, you didn't know that before. There are people that on the natural plane, even before they ever discovered any spiritual gift of hell, all the thing within them is that they just like to hell. Just naturally. Just naturally. They have this uh, thing that is called sympathy, compassion within them, love within them, just an open hand. They just like to help everybody, every time, everywhere, no matter the tribe the person is coming from. And then the person becomes a Christian. And the Lord is still giving him now a spiritual gift, health. Others, government. You know that's uh, administration. You know that's a gift, spiritual gift in the church. And you know there are people that have that gift, they'll never de de discover it or develop it. Because, you know, if you don't discover what the gifts are that God has given you in the church, and use that gift in whichever area the Lord is calling you, you'll find that you are a misfit. And you'll really not be able to do much. And then it says diversities of tongues. And then it says are all apostles? The answer is no. Are all prophets? The answer is no. Are all teachers? The answer is no. Are all workers of miracle? The answer is no. But the pity is that everybody in the church just wants to do exactly the same thing. If they get converted through an apostle, they want to be an apostle. If they got converted through a prophet, they want to be a prophet. If they get converted through a teacher... And they have been under a teacher who has been teaching them systematically. They also want to be teachers. And if they are converted, if they are brought into the fold under a miracle worker, they also want to be miracle workers. But discover the gift. Use the gift. Develop the gift. Now in First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As every man has received the gift... Even so minister the same, one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, as everyone has received the gift. You find out in your life if you are called, if you are a believer, every believer is called to pray. You know, you pray for other people in need, you get into that ministry of intercession, and uh, you start giving your testimony. You start telling other people how good the Lord has been to you. That's a ministry in itself. That's a call already. Because if you will count step number one, God will lead you to step number two. If you'll go through step number two, God will lead you to step number three. But you know, if you'll never take any step, 
if you'll never get on that ladder that goes to the uh, peak of success, if you're waiting until all of a sudden you'll just hear a voice from heaven saying, I've chosen you to be an apostle. If you're waiting until that time, the voice may never come. But you start where you are. If all you can do is use your voice in singing, start right there. If all you can do is telling other people how good the Lord has been to you, start right there. If all you can do is kneeling down and setting an hour apart every day and praying for your family, praying for the church, and praying for uh, areas in the church, start right there. If all you can do is going about and distributing Christian literature and saying, oh, you will enjoy this, you will enjoy this, and God will make you a spiritual salesman to just get that literature across to all the people in your community, start right there. Because, you know, as you start, as you start in step number one, the Lord will lead you to step number two, and then step number Number three, and who knows, God might eventually get you to being an established teacher in the church of the Lord. Or God might just uh, eventually get you to the point where you are an apostle. God, only God knows what is preparing you for, but start where you are with the spiritual gift that God has put in your life. Now, they used what they had. Number two, I told you before that they had boldness. That is the ability to continue in God's, in God's word, in God's will, in God's work, though there is opposition. And you know, if you have that ability, you, you need that ability. Even the moment you become a Christian, you need boldness to some extent to be able to overcome those persecutions and still be able to stand, stand your ground. And you need that when you, when you begin to witness because as soon as you go to confront a person with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know you are going to meet some men that are going to just tell you all. They are going to tell you, I don't want anything of that as thing you are preaching. I am not a sinner. You get away from my sight. You will never get me to accept that Jesus as Savior. I am good enough already. And those people, they are going to make you tremble. But you know, you need the spiritual quality of boldness and stand right there and say, you man, you don't know your need. You need Jesus Christ as Savior. I was a proud sinner like you before and I didn't think I, need Jesus, I needed Jesus Christ. But somebody just got through to me and I got it. And you know, you need to stand your ground and be bold. And you know, in the ministry of prayer, you are going to discover if that boldness is not there, the devil is going to just come to you immediately, your knees strike the ground, and he's going to tell you, you are not good enough to pray for a church. You are not good enough to intercede for anybody. You have a lot of problems in your life already. And uh, you know, the, the devil is going to be telling you how weak you are, how worthless you are, and that you are not able to pray for anybody for any reason. You are not the type of person that the Lord will answer his prayer, and here you have to come with boldness, with your boldness and you tell the devil off and say you are washed in the blood of Jesus. You are covered in the blood of Jesus. The promises of God are yea and amen for you. And if you bind anything on the face of the earth, it will be bound in heaven. If you lose anything on earth, it will be loose in heaven. And when the devil sees that you are standing your ground in your ministry of praying, in your ministry of witnessing and, testi and testimony giving, the devil is going to run away from you. And whatever it is you are doing, you know, even in music, even as an usher, as a fellowship leader, the devil is not going to make it very easy for you. It has never been easy for anybody. Never, never easy for anybody that actually wants uh, to use his spiritual gifts for the Lord. But you need to be bold. Have the ability to continue in the word of the Lord, the will of God, and the work of God, even though there is opposition. And you are going to need wisdom. My brothers and my sisters, uh, you know, we all have ten fingers. But what I do with my ten fingers and what you do with your ten fingers will depend on the amount of wisdom that my brain is able to pass to my fingers. You know, we all have two eyes to read, two eyes to see. But what my eyes are able to catch will depend upon the thing that the information that is coming from my mind from my brain from my heart on through to my eyes and you know that we have many of us have abilities but then what you're able to do with the ability eventually will depend on what amount of wisdom you have because you know whatever else you have if you don't have wisdom to be able to carry on the work of god you know, evangelists don't think that they need wisdom. They think that all they need is have, you know, a message for the sinners. That Jesus saves and Jesus saves and Jesus delivers. 
You know, sometimes an evangelist may just have to have a lot of wisdom to know how to give the, how to put the approach, how to put the message across. You know, a teacher will think that all he needs is an understanding of the doctrine. Just know the doctrine, study the doctrine, and if you know the doctrine, that is enough, and you can just teach any congregation, anytime, anywhere. But no, the teacher needs a lot of wisdom. And you know, there are people who feel that God has given me gifts, now gifts of healing, and I can just lay my hands on the sick at any time and get them healed. But you know the problem, if, all, if that is all you do, and you do not have the wisdom, you may communicate healing to the people, and the people may receive healing without receiving the healer. And the people may receive uh, what, uh, the blessing without receiving the blesser. But you know, if you have the wisdom, you'll give them the healing and they receive the healer at the same time. And you give them the blessing and then they receive the person that is blessing at the same time. And they just worship God. Wisdom is important. In Proverbs chapter 4, and I'm reading verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Whatever we are called to do in the fold, in the church, in the service of the Lord. Oh yes, we need wisdom. Sometimes uh, there are people that have a lot of knowledge. And then you ask them questions, Bible questions. And with their knowledge of Greek and Hebrew and Latin and French and Spanish and English and uh, native language and vernacular. And their knowledge of culture, their knowledge of uh, Israel, their knowledge of New Testament, Old Testament. You ask them a question in the Bible and they answer and nobody gets saved. Because they are not able to use the knowledge they have in a wise way. In a wise way. You know there are a lot of people that have a good command of English. And when they talk like this, their grammar alone will blow your head without touching your heart. They have a lot of knowledge, but there is no wisdom at all. And you know, if they talk to children, the children will never understand the story of the Savior. The story of redemption. The story of, you know, heaven. The children will never understand. Oh, but it takes a man that goes beyond the realm of knowledge and he comes into wisdom. And when he's answering questions, he leads them in the wisdom of God right to the Savior, to the Redeemer. And he leads them to the path that leads to heaven. Now, we need wisdom in everything that we do. And the Bible says wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, with all thy getting, get wisdom. And do not forget understanding. Then there is a necessity for power. Power to manifest signs, the signs that point to the Savior. If you are coming to this um, Bible church, this location, and you did not see anybody to ask, but you had eyes to see, all you needed to do was to be looking at signboards, and the signs will point you to the church. You know, the miracles are signs. That's why they are called signs and wonders in the Bible. Because, you know, a sinner who totally has been ignorant of the power of God, he does not understand the location where you can find Christ. He sees a sign, and that sign is pointing to somewhere, and he wonders. He sees another sign, and that sign is pointing somewhere, and he wonders. And all those signs are pointing to Jesus and his name, Jesus and his power, Jesus and the resurrection, Jesus and his ability to save, ability to deliver. And uh, if those signs, if they point well, if those miracles, signs and wonders, if they point to the right direction, eventually those signs will lead them to the Savior. And if you are going to really work for God, you better understand that there must be power. You know, you find, you find people that will think that you only need power if you are the pastor of a deeper life Bible church. But no, we all need power. As a house fellowship leader, you need power. You know, power varies. You look at that battery you put in your torchlight, and you read the label on it, and it says power. And that's power. Because if all you need is to just light that to torchlight, you need that battery that will give some power. But you know that power will not be able to make your car move. Because you need another battery now. Still power. But you need another battery now for the car. But you know the battery that is able to make the car move. That battery may not be able to operate a printing machine. You know that. That's still another battery. But that's power. 
and then the one that you use for, uh, for a printing machine may not be able to carry a whole factory that's still power but you start somewhere if you ask fellowship leader you need power maybe power for a touch light but that's still power you need it in a measure and when you become an area leader, zona leader, you become a pastor, you become a missionary, you still need power. It is still the power but in a greater sense, in a dynamic sense. And we all need the power of God, but we have been given the promise, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses, ye shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then there is the necessity for humility. Humility. That thing must be basic because it's necessary. It's indispensable. Now, it's an area we need to be very, very careful. Very, very careful. You know, for power, an evangelist recognizes many times when the power is leaking out, too much talking now, his, his tap is leaking, or is uh, you know mixing too much with um, with society you know visiting here visiting there and talking here talking there just mixing with society Ephraim has mixed with the people and it's like a cake half baked therefore it begins to lose his power or it begins to find that he's sitting too much and therefore the body is becoming fatter the spirit is becoming thinner all the vitamins are passed on to the body and there's no vitality within the spirit or the soul. It begins to recognize that the power is not there as it used to be there. Now it is easy to recognize that. But it is not easy to recognize when the humility is leaking out. When that man is no more humble. But you know, you must humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Because that humility is very, very essential. Very essential. Important. Very, very basic and indispensable. Because if you lose that humility to the degree that you are humble, the Lord will be near unto you. To the degree that you are proud, the Lord will be far from you. Then there is a need for persistence. A great factor in anyone who wills and determines and commits himself to succeed. Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. And before you can do that, you must persevere. You must be persistent. And say, come what may, anytime, I will go on. I will finish this sin. I will finish this race. And if you make up your mind that you are going to finish up the race, you are going to finish the course, you are going to carry on everything the Lord wants you to do, if you make up your mind like that, the Lord will see you through in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it doesn't matter how weak you feel you are. Naturally. How timid you think you are. Naturally. There is the Spirit of God in you. And if you will stir up the gift that is in you. And you will just use those gifts. Be bold for the Lord. Be wise for the Lord. Maintain that power by waiting upon the Lord once in a while. Getting into the Bible, eating good portions of the Bible. Good portions of the Bible. That will give you power. And praying a lot. Talking to God a lot. And um, withdrawing yourself from the things that make power to leak out in human life. And if you will just remain humble and always say, God, you are everything, I am nothing. Without you, I will be weak as any other person. All the things that you do through me, I pass all the glory to you, all the praises to you. And you are humble in the midst of your brethren, in the midst of the people of God. And then you are persistent. You just keep on doing it. If you happen to fail, you keep on doing it. If you happen to fail, you keep on doing it. If you happen not to have gone to the peak and to the high level, you keep on doing it. If you preach and nobody gets saved, you keep on preaching. If you sing and nobody gets inspired, you keep on singing. If you do a particular work and nobody even says they benefited at all, you keep on doing it. You say, Lord, I've surrendered everything to you. And I'm going to keep on trying my best until the blessing of heaven, the dew of heaven, will come on the best I'm giving unto you. I'm going to be diligent, faithful, and persistent. You know, eventually, the breakthrough will come. The showers of heaven will come. 
and it will be a blessing on the people that you are ministering to. Now, let's look at the last two that just briefly. Follow up is the next one. In uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, verse 21 to, 20, to verse 23. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and they had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Now, returning here, they had walked here before. They had walked in this Lystra, Iconium, and this Antioch. This is not the Antioch, uh, they came out from this, another Antioch. They had walked in. Follow it up. You know, you will never make it. You know, people think that follow up is necessary only in, um, only in uh, evangelism. But you know, this is what I've discovered all through my life. I was a student in school. My teacher taught me. I put all those things in my notebook. I never went back on that thing again. I felt since I understood everything from beginning to end when I was in the class. I didn't need to do any follow-up again. Read it over again. Go over the same ground again. I went to the exam hall. I, I couldn't remember the things I thought I knew. You know, I studied music. And when I studied music, I saw that, uh, you know, that book of exercises, and I felt that this is a small book, I can finish this within a short time, and I did exercise one, exercise two, exercise three, in a, on a keyboard, and I didn't feel that follow-up was necessary to go back to the thing I started before, and you know the time uh, later when I tried to play exercise four. I saw that I had not trained my fingers to be able to get on that keyboard and get all those exercises through now because I didn't go back on one and two and three and I missed a lot. You know, I had had friends before and I didn't know that you needed follow up at all. We became acquainted, we exchanged addresses and he just said, anytime you just need this, you need that, I'll be willing to help you. Oh, I felt it was all right. And then maybe about two years, the need came to contact that friend again. And uh, I contacted him. He had forgotten my name. He had forgotten my face. He had forgotten the promise he made. He wanted to help me. You know what I failed to do? I didn't do follow-up. When he gave me his address, I didn't go back again on the same thing. And still, you know, and uh, foster that friendship and fellowship and deepen that thing and go over it all over again. And you know, we've, we've done Christian work and there are places we've gone and the people have just said, oh, they came out in large numbers. And uh, then we just left them like that and we praise the Lord, the people, they have been converted, they came to the church. And one year later, we go to visit that church and we find that the number we met in that church a year ago is still the same number now. You know what happened? Those uh, converts, they came, we didn't follow up again. Go over the work you started. Have you seen a businessman who has, you know, invested a lot of capital and has put the capital on the work and says, so we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then he has put all the workers where they ought to be and then he goes to just enjoy himself. He comes back six months after. The capital is eating up. The work is collapsing. All the workers are dishonest and unfaithful. You know what he has not done? He has not done follow up. And it's the same thing for the house fellowship leader. It's the same thing for uh, the Christian worker. It's the same thing for a member of the choir. It's the same thing for a preacher. You must go back on the thing you started before. Follow. And uh, Paul and Barnabas, they realize that it's very, very important to go over that ground again. To go over that walk again. To see those people again. And this is what you must do as a visitation worker. As an house fellowship leader, as um, a pastor, as a zona leader, this is what you must do. Go over that thing again. Now, have you, have you noticed how I would teach, even in the Bible? Because, you know, if I wasn't doing follow-up on what we did the previous Mondays, we would have finished that Acts of the Apostles long ago. But, you know, we come like this on a Monday, and I go over what we did before. And you know, some of you will say, oh, brother, get ahead. We already know that. And then when I begin to talk about the same thing we talked about before, the boldness, the power, the humility, the wisdom, the persistence. Oh, you said, uh, we thought that you exhausted it last Monday, but this is new again. Let's follow up. And that is the thing that makes you sure on what you have learned. Because all the time before we go to a new thing, we'll revise the old. Before we go to a new thing, we revise the old. We go over the ground we covered before. 
and it will help in your evangelism. It will help in your Christian endeavor. It will help in the Christian work that the Lord has committed in your hand. Now, Paul and Barnabas, they went over again to these places. And look at what they did in verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples. Now, follow up as they did it. Consists of confirmation, exhortation, organization, and intercession. Now, confirmation. They confirmed the souls of the disciples. That means they supported them. Actually, in the Greek, it means, it means they put a support or prop underneath them. Because, you know, new converts are likely, uh, they have the tendency of being unstable. But you go there and you put a support under them. Give them more promises of the Lord, more encouragement. And you give them the, more of the word of God. You are teaching them, strengthening them, helping them, feeding them, nurturing them, so that they will be able to stand on their feet, so that they will be able to walk in the Spirit, and so that they will be able to grow in the Lord. Then number two is exhortation, because it says, they exhorted them to continue in the faith. And exhortation is very important in, in follow-up. One, as you go out to follow up the new converts, you are supporting them. You are not criticizing them, telling them, so you didn't read your Bible this morning. I'm ashamed of you. No, support him. Oh, you didn't read your Bible this morning? When I was a, when I was a new Christian, there were days I forgot. You begin to tell him about your life. But I found that the days I forgot, the devil knew that I forgot my Bible, and I saw that the temptations and the arrows and the trials of that day, they were more than the days before. And I quickly went back to my Bible. Now you must always read your Bible and pray every day if you are going to grow. If you are going to stand. Because you are going to meet a lot of the attacks of the devil, of the arrows of the devil, of the deception of the devil during the day. And in the morning, you must take time to study that Bible, read that Bible. And let the Lord speak to you so that the Lord can prepare you for the day. You are supporting that convert. You are teaching that convert. You are strengthening him. You are helping him, feeding him, nurturing him. So that he will be able to stand. And so that he will be able to walk in the spirit. Then he will be able to grow. You are confirming that individual. You know, it's the same thing even when workers are selected. You see how to follow up on those workers. Because, you know, as soon as a worker is selected, number one is very happy. And then with that joy and happiness, he reaches out. And as he reaches out, you know what happens to him? He finds that the work he's given to do, he gets zero percent. He, he wanted, he felt that, I'll say this way, I'll say this way, I'll say this way. He got to the place, he forgot everything he planned, they will say. It didn't happen to you before like that. Uh -huh. And then, when your zona leader meets you, he needs to do follow-up to confirm you. And then you'll say, my brother, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I can be a worker. Then he begins to support you. And he begins to teach you. And he begins to strengthen you. And help and feed and nurture. And you know the first time uh, when I started uh, music, I felt that I could sing as well as Jim Reeves. I just, I just felt that I could sing at any time, anywhere. And you know, I felt that I could play the organ and accompany any singer, any time. And then they had a junior chorus in the church I was going. And then they selected us together. And uh, they said, now you are going to sing. I said, yes, because all those notes had learned everything. I knew everything. The theory. Because, you know, if you can study theorems in mathematics, you can study rudiments of music. Because those things, you know, music becomes a small thing. I mean, the theory, not the practical. Um, it becomes a small thing if you can go through all those theorems in mathematics. And I crammed all those things, knew all those things. Now they gave us a song in Broadman to sing. And I just, I was very sure that that's it. I didn't even need to hold that book at all. Then we came on Sunday morning. And we stood before the people. All of a sudden, I saw the church. I saw members in the church I never saw before. You know, I'd been seeing them all the time. But when I got on that stage and I was now to sing, I was off the key from the first note. I was afraid that the music teacher already will notice it now and he will say that I've spoiled everything. All the other people were trying to look bad. They couldn't look bad. They were saying, ah, uh ah, -uh, now sing this thing well now. 
you know, I'd been telling them before that my voice is just good baritone and I could just give it out to anybody. And um, when we finished that song, I didn't want anybody to talk to me. Because I knew what they were likely to say. I just avoided all of those people that would look at me and say, you spoiled everything. But you know, when you start like that, and it's the first time you're doing it, you need a lot of support. And a lot of encouragement. And a lot of strength. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're singing or leading house fellowship or you're just a new convert, you need the confirmation. That is part of the follow-up. And the music teacher, you know, I was surprised he never even talked about it, that I spoiled everything. And he just encouraged God and he said, well, uh, you don't often get 100% at the time you begin any type of work that you can do better. And he gave us another chance again. You know, that's how to really do follow-up. The people that may be even inferior in themselves and they feel that they cannot do this and that they have failed the church and they have failed you teaching them and they have failed everybody else but you encourage them, you support them, you teach them, you feed them, you nurture them. And now in the exhortation you are urging those believers to continue in the faith at whatever cost. You are urging them to continue that difficulties may come, persecution may come but continue. And live a good, balanced Christian lifestyle. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading from verse 8. From verse 9. No, we'll take verse 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted you and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. How does a father nurture, exhort, encourage a little child? When the child is learning to walk, that child may make some mistakes, fumble, fall down. You pick him up. When a child is trying to pick up the language, he doesn't speak the language perfectly from the beginning. You help him, you encourage him. If he calls the first word he's trying to call in a bad way, you laugh, you smile, you say, Oh, you are making it, you have started to talk already. Oh, that encouragement will allow that child to go on. And then it says in verse 12, That ye would walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. So in our follow-up, let's remember, encourage people, exhort people, support them, teach them. And then in verse 23, they did some organization. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, they ordained them elders in every church because they knew they were going away as the apostles, as the founders of the world. But they needed to put elders, bishops, pastors, teachers within those churches so that the work they did will be continued by those workers. And that's a very important part of the work of God. Because if they chose the wrong leaders, the wrong elders, the work they began in the spirit will end up in the flesh and that work will be destroyed. And then there is this part of intercession. Verse 23. And, they pray, and when they had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. We must always pray for our new converts. The people we're following up. The people you're visiting. As a house fellowship leader, the people you're teaching and feeding and nurturing and helping. The, the house fellowship days, visit them, encourage them. Give them the promises of God. Never, never condemn them. Never, never condemn them. Have they made a mistake? Never condemn. Never condemn. Oh yes, what you've done is bad, but God will forgive. God will help. And if you'll just keep on, the Lord will strengthen you that he'll make you have the ability never to do that again. Always have a word of encouragement for the people you're following up. Zona leader to the workers. Encourage those workers as follow up. Confirm them. Exhort them. Head usher for the ushers. Encourage those ushers. We don't get 100% the moment we start the work of God. Even when um, we're continuing in that work of God for two years, three years, sometimes we don't always get 100%. Encourage them. Encourage them. Support them. If there is an area of ignorance, prepare for them and teach them. And in all the areas of our work, this is what our sectional leaders will need to do. 
sectional leaders, um, you know, whether choir or ushers or zona leaders, area leaders, whatever it is, or IFL, uh, you are in charge of some other workers, always have an encouragement for them, exhortation for them, support for them. If they are weak, strengthen them. And then make sure that you are interceding for them. You are praying for them. Let their problems be your problem. Let the anxieties touch you. Let the infirmities touch you. Give them over to the Lord. Commending them unto the Lord on whom they have believed. And then from verse 24 to verse 28. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atalia. And they had sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. They came back to that same church, Antioch. They didn't branch off and go off and say, we are now great apostles. We do not need the home church anymore. We do not need the headquarters anymore. We already have worked miracles. The impotent has risen. And then you remember in chapter 13, that uh, person by Jesus, uh, the person that was wanting to withdraw the deputy from the faith, we had um, had spiritual apostolic authority on him. The power is there. The knowledge is there. The boldness is there. All the qualities are there. We don't need a home church anymore. That's, that will be a bad attitude. Uh, you know some as fellowship leaders, now God has given them some measure of success. And they don't think they need the area leaders anymore. Bad, bad attitude. You know, some area leaders, they have prayed for some people. They have got healed. And they have, uh, you know, the work in their area has grown. And they don't think they need to report back to the Zona leader anymore. Bad attitude. You know, Zona leaders who may feel that now, wonderful, when this zone was started, it was just about 300. Now it's more than 1,000. How successful I am. And they don't think they need to question anybody, to have question from the pastor or to receive counseling anymore or to report back. And know that they were put there to do something. And now they must report back to their quarters. Bad attitude. Sectional leaders. Now you've got some measure of success. What you didn't know before. What you couldn't do before. Now you are getting them done. And you don't think that the pastor needs to even uh, see anything you are doing anymore. You know it all now. You are now getting 100% in everything you do. You don't need any teacher, any instructor, any shepherd, any pastor. Bad attitude. But you know, Barnabas and Paul they came back to Antioch. And they rehearsed, look at verse 27, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. Not all that we have done, big short, big apostle, great miracle worker, no, all that God, God, all that God had done, right from the depths of their soul. From the bottom of their hearts, as we say. From the inner being of their being. They felt it was only God that did it. And they rehearsed with joy and humility. With praise to God and appreciation for being used of God. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. And how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. You know, in the church... That's the attitude you ought to have. And anytime you begin to say, well, how could the pastor ever talk to me like that, thinking, knowing all that I have done in this church, you have missed the point. But every time you understand that God did this with me, through me, I appreciate God for it, I praise God for it, I rejoice but I'm humble about it. And you rehearse all that God has done, God has done, God has done, God has done, rather than you doing it, whatever it is. You're using your talent and you're getting the work of the Lord being done. Tip ministry, building section, printing section, coordinating the work of the stage. Zona leader, area leader, members in the choir, ushers. 
And now we thank God things are better than it used to be. God is using us, inspiring us, leading us, and is just uh, making use of what we're giving to the Lord. Is making use of it to make the church to grow. God has done it. If I, if I planted and Apollos watered, if God did not do, give the increase, it will be nothing. But I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So all the glory, all the praise must always go to God. And there must be that link of the headquarters church all the time. They went out from Antioch, they came back to Antioch. And in humility, they reported back what God had done. And there they abode long time with the disciples. They remained with the church in Antioch and they continued the work of the Lord. That's what the attitude should be. If we send missionaries out and they come back to the headquarters church, they will willingly take the assignment that we give them. They continued, they abode long time with the disciples. If you've been sent on a special missionary assignment, evangelistic assignment, preaching assignment, and then you come back, you are not worrying the church and saying, now I've been a great preacher. When I went out there to, um, to Pamphylia, I went out there to Lystra, to Iconium, to all those places, uh, the sick was healed, sinners were saved. Even all the villagers, they wanted to worship us as if we are idols. Now, I can't sit down anymore. I can't sit down in the headquarters church and just be teaching only house fellowship, only leading his own, send me out again. No, that will be pride. Paul and, Paul and uh, Barnabas, they are bold. Long time with the disciples in that church. Beautiful spirit of humility, of yieldedness, of submission within the church. And when we have all this, the Lord will use us more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember your call and remember that you need to yield yourself to the Lord so that what God has started, the Lord will perfect in your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and pray. Surrender yourself to the Lord. You see all that He has taught us? You need that boldness in your Christian life and in your Christian endeavor. Wisdom as well. And power and humility and persistence and follow up follow up on your children if you have children follow up on your converts if you have converts follow up in any assignment that you have been given to do in the church your music, go over those things again. Do proper follow. And at the end of the day, when the work is done, when the souls are saved, when the sick are healed, when demons have been cast out, when you have manifested the power of God, report back to the church. Don't branch off in isolation. Report back to the church. Don't become proud and isolated. Report back to the church. Don't run off and start a different ministry, a different church. Report back to the headquarters. Report back to the church.